It's my pleasure to introduce you to the first technical session, which is the today's invited speaker, and it's George Fitbanks, who is here. And uh, it's my honor and my pleasure to introduce you, George. First, George, I want to thank you so much for being here. As you understood, the process of selection of uh, invited speakers was very tough because we were eight of us uh, with three Italians in the community, so we had a, a long list. And uh, I have to tell you that uh, at the beginning, when, when your name was out, somebody told, no, he's too busy, he will not come. <laughs> so we are very thankful that you are here today. And you were unanimously voted for being invited speaker. So you, you were promoted. And thank you for being here. George is from Google. He's, um, in his biography, he says that he's a consultant, educator, and uh, many things. But he's also a very good researcher, I would say. He has been researching and developing software since the 80s. He has written a book on just enough software architecture, which is a quite famous book. And he got a PhD at Carnegie Mellon with uh, David Garland and Bill Shelley. And he has introduced some important concepts in, the, in this area, uh, like design fragments. Um, he has a long list of publications, uh, main conferences and journal like Oxla and ICSI. And uh, I will not steal more time. I will leave time to George for his talk about building theories, building uh, values. Thank you for being here. Grazie. <laughs> Prego. Well, uh, I now officially have gigantic imposter syndrome. Um, that's a term that we sometimes use inside of Google for feeling like uh, you don't belong here. Uh, this is clearly the nicest room I have ever been in. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here talking to you. Uh, in fact, the word at the end of here says silence, and uh, that's sort of what I feel like I should be doing and sitting down and let someone else talk. Um, let me talk a bit about where, what the origins of this talk came from. Uh, for the past couple years, uh, I am someone who loves models, and I think that I'm in the right audience for people that love models also. I, for a couple years, I've been trying to convince uh, people that they should pay more attention to models, not less attention, because the temptation is always, I would prefer to write code rather than build models. But as software architects, we know that the models are often the way that leads to clarity and to understanding of things. So uh, when uh, incomprehensibly, the committee decided to invite me here. Uh, I decided that it was time to put together a, uh, an argument for models. Uh, and that's what this talk is about. Building theories is building value. I want to understand how to build systems. That's something that drives me. But it's a good question to ask, what does it mean to understand something? OK, now I realize that right at the beginning of the talk, we are in the deep end of philosophy. So let me give you uh, an operational definition. If you're working on a project and you grab a software developer from that project and drag them over to a whiteboard and you start asking them questions, you ask them to zoom in and out of detail on the software system. You ask them about things that don't quite work right, the technical debt in the system. You ask them about cross-cutting concerns such as quality attributes. And you ask them how ready is the system to support some hypothetical requirements. These are the kinds of things that you would expect uh, a software developer who really understands the system to be able to do. So let's use that as what we're shooting for. We want developers to be able to do that because that's what we believe is understanding a system. But we also have to understand that, or we have to believe that uh, we're not being completely successful at developing these kinds of engineers. Uh, a lot of engineers don't really understand their systems. They may understand part of it. They may not be able to zoom in and out. And they may have difficulty with quality attributes. The next question is, if uh, an engineer joins a team, how long does it take become before they actually understand the system? Is that a quick process, or does that take years? And also, is it possible for younger engineers to have that kind of understanding early, or do they need to wait until they're old engineers with gray hair? And then finally, how did they learn about the systems? How did they learn to learn about systems? Okay, these are all good questions. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about building theories as a way to get exactly what we want. Because building theories is actually building value, both for the engineer and for the company. I'm going to talk primarily about two main topics. 
Uh, the first one is theory building in itself. Now, I would expect this is not a phrase, theory building, that many of you uh, have heard before, uh, unless you like to, well, unless you read the, the, the funny literature that I like to read. Uh, and second is that uh, programming is a kind of distributed cognition. Again, this is a phrase maybe not everyone has heard before. It comes from psychology, and we're going to chat about that. So the three big ideas here are that programming is about building theories, not about typing source code that those theories are critical for understanding the programs, and that actually if you approach what we're doing from that perspective, you take a look at the current practice and you say, I think we could do better. We should do things a little bit differently than we are today. Okay, first section, programming is theory building. I never got a chance to meet Peter Naur. Uh, he wrote an essay in 1985 uh, where he said very succinctly, Programming properly should be regarded as an activity by which the programmers form or achieve a certain kind of insight, a theory of the matters at hand. He goes on throughout the essay uh, to talk about a philosopher named Royal uh, who has described uh, how we should understand things. And when we understand things, it means we've built up a theory inside of our heads. He then goes on uh, to say here that this is in contrast to what people would say is programming is about typing programs. So in order to understand what understanding is, uh, we distinguish knowing that from knowing how. So knowing that is a pile of facts. So if you consider addition as a simple example of this, uh, someone can memorize a table of addition facts. Uh, but the problem is that they don't have a generalized understanding of addition. They could tell you that two and two is four and four and four is eight, but perhaps once they get outside of the memorized table, they can tell you absolutely nothing. In that sense, they could be said to have no theory of addition. Contrast that with someone else who can perhaps add small numbers, uh, but they make mistakes with bigger numbers, but they have a basic idea that addition makes numbers bigger. Okay, so you're never gonna say two and two is one, right, because that's going the wrong direction. They're not gonna make that kind of mistake. So in this sense, uh, someone who understands addition has a theory of how it works. So what does it mean to understand software? Let me uh, juxtapose two different engineers. The first one is a developer who can report facts about a program, and we are all familiar with that as uh, seeing it in ourselves and in other people. Perhaps if you ask them about a particular module, they can point to you exactly the places where certain things are happening. But if you drag them over to the whiteboard again and ask them these penetrating questions like we posed at the beginning, they may have difficulty doing that. Let me suggest that the second kind of developer, the one that has the internalized kind of theory, is not only rare, this is a developer who's extremely valuable for the company. Like any number of engineers that can have expertise in individual modules is not the same as having one engineer or two engineers that understand how everything fits together, what it's ready for next. So let me seed a couple questions that we're gonna follow up with later in the talk. The first one is, how do we get more of these Chalk Talk ready developers? The second is, does our university curriculum, as it exists today, uh, do enough to get those? And third is, if you look at industrial practices, particularly the processes that we follow, do those things help or hurt us in achieving those kinds of developers? So one way you may have been taught to think about programs is that the program is a box that has some inputs that it's given and some outputs that it's supposed to produce. And let me suggest that uh, I love abstract models, this is an abstract model, but perhaps this one has dropped too many details because it doesn't let me think about the problem that I'm trying to solve right now very effectively. The first is the time dimension. Now, when this model was proposed, um, it might have even been the case that we produced programs and then put them aside, okay? I even suggest that at the time this came out, that was not true, but it's certainly not true today. Uh, there are only a small number of programs that you write and then discard forever, okay? That, in fact, they're an uninteresting category of programs. Second is that it assumes, uh, when you look at this model, that like my job as the programmer is to go get that box and I'm gonna optimize that box. I'm gonna build the best box that takes those inputs and produces the outputs. And it neglects the fact that we are human beings and not, say, a neural network that we train up over iterations to be optimized. The third one is that it assumes a certain kind of omniscience. When we look at that program, we assume that we understand everything about the program. 
If you think about any large software system today, the knowledge about how to build it is actually distributed amongst a team. There's no individual that understands the entire program and how it's supposed to produce those outputs. And finally, it neglects the teamwork aspect in that even if each one of us could build the entire program, we actually have to collaborate with other people who don't see things the same way in order to produce that program. Okay, so let me propose a different model, a better way to think about this. Let me have you take a look at theories in sciences. And let me first admit, admit that this is a cartoon, okay? Uh, that real scientists probably don't work this way, but this is the way we like to think about scientists working. Imagine that each one of those dots is an observation of the world, okay? And sometimes the dots represent something that your theory explains, okay? It's consistent with your theory. And then some of those dots represent, I looked at the world and it's doing something that my theory doesn't explain, okay? It's an indication that my theory and the world are not matched up, okay? So if you're a scientist then, what you're trying to do is build a theory that minimizes the number of those dots that don't match your theory, okay? You can also choose a metric here that says how well you understand something is how well your theory matches the observations. So if we had a perfect series of gray dots, that would indicate that my theory really matches the observed world and that I really understand the observed world. So let's try applying that to software. Here's what that model looks like for software. Over time, I have a bunch of program outputs. Sometimes my program outputs don't quite match uh, the way that the world is supposed to be working. Uh, and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to build a program that evolves over time that's able to satisfy its requirements. And what I'm trying to avoid specifically is that I build a program for a while and I hit a dead end and there's nowhere else for this program to go. There's just no way that I'm gonna be able to satisfy the next requirement because my theory is too weak, okay? And again, how well I understand the system represents how well my program can produce the outputs that it's supposed to be doing. So consider, you know, like everyone loves this example. Uh, we used to believe that the sun uh, and the heavens revolved around the earth. Uh, we built increasingly complicated models to support that theory, and that's on the left. And on the right, there was a breakthrough that says, aha, actually things seem to be much simpler now uh, if we uh, stop trying to push harder and harder on the old theory and that we embrace a new theory. So you see the same kind of thing happening in the writings about domain-driven design. Uh, so here's a quote from Eric Evans, uh, where he says that oftentimes you're working on a, on a program, you're doing small little incremental refactorings, and then suddenly it's just like a dam bursts and you have a release. And you're like, oh, I see how this works. And you achieve a deeper insight. And even though your model is simpler, it explains more and more about how the world works. Okay? And I think that's what we're really shooting for. That's the kind of thing that me as a software developer, I'm always searching for that moment when finally the complexity melts away. So let's return to the quote that we had at the beginning here uh, and specifically focus on the second part. This suggestion is in contrast to what appears to be a more common notion that programming should be regarded as production of a program and certain other texts, okay? So hopefully this quote makes a little bit more sense now, now that we sort of said, here's what we mean by theory building. So I'm gonna do something completely unfair and I'm gonna put those words in the mouth of the pointy haired boss from Dilbert. And he says, programming should be regarded as a production of text, uh, of a program and certain other texts, okay? So you can totally imagine uh, someone whose job it is uh, to run a company and to build software, and he's listening to this talk and he's going, you guys are crazy. You're in your ivory tower and you're trying to say that programming is about building models that don't make me any money. And on the right-hand side, I'd like to point out that if you're a member of that software development team and every single time you push that snowball, uh, it accumulates a little bit more snow and it gets harder and harder to push, you're trying to tell your boss that it isn't about pushing the snowball because at some point if you have that release and you have that complexity reduction, it's actually good for the business and that's the thing that's gonna enable your business to go on to the next set of requirements and the next one. So here's the good news and bad news. The good news is that developers actually love knowing how things work. I think that's one of the reasons that people like us are attracted to this field. That uh, Nauer's essay actually goes on beyond that quote. I know it's longer than the one quote. Uh, and he actually suggests that when developers leave a project, they take the theory with them 
and then the program dies. And that just hasn't been borne out by actual experience with programs. So there's something interesting going on there. And the third thing is that we embed our theories inside of our software. We don't call our variables X and Y. We call them customers and total revenue. So here's the bad news, is that actually we're not very good at theory building. I mean, that is, we do it automatically internally. But as far as being explicit and external about it, we're lousy. And second is that processes really make it hard to do that work. And we're going to talk about that a bit more. So what we're going to move on to next is the idea is that uh, programming is a kind of distributed cognition, which is a term from psychology. OK, so hopefully at this point, uh, we're at the situation where you are intrigued by the idea that programming is really more about building theories than it is about typing programs, which is an unusual notion when you first hear it. Where we're going to go from here is we're going to uh, reflect on our own abilities to think, which is a strange thing to do. Uh, there's a story that says that Marvin Minsky famously assigned computer vision to a couple of graduate students. Okay, now we know in hindsight that computer vision is a dramatically hard problem and completely unsolvable in the 1960s, okay, uh, with the computing power that we have. So are we in a situation now where we are doing the same thing when we talk about building theories? Maybe building theories is one of those things that are, is really easy for human beings to do, but when you lay it out as to exactly what we're doing, it's actually incredibly complicated. So what I need you to do is I need you to be able to reflect on yourself well enough that you don't think about yourself as the idealized thinker, but instead you realize that you're more like that squirrel from the, or that dog from the movie Up who ha, was always distracted by the squirrels. So some of you may have seen the Stroop effect, okay? And in the Stroop effect, uh, you have a bunch of words that you're asking uh, people to look at, but those words actually have colors like this. And so instead of reading the word, like the first uh, one there is yellow, so instead of saying yellow, you ask the people to say the color of the word, which is green, okay? Now, if you just had a bunch of squares that were different colors, you could go right through this very quickly. But if I ask you to say the word green, when you're looking at the word yellow, you can start to see the machinery in the brain working, okay? That what it sees in the outside world and what it's trying to think about are mismatched, and when that happens, you end up with worse performance. In fact, this is what the performance looks like. And so what you can see from the two different humps is that when the word and the color are aligned, you get fast performance. And when the word and the color are misaligned, you get slow performance. OK. Now, this is a trivial, small, far from computer programming example. Uh, let's take a look at some more examples that get us closer to this idea that we're actually doing computation in our head and we're working with theories. Let's take a look at long division. I bet you guys haven't really thought about long division very much, okay? It's something that we all learn as children about how to divide numbers, and the teacher, like, by rote, tells us how to make scribbles on a piece of paper, and now, if I ask you to divide numbers, first, you'll pull out your calculator or your cell phone, and then I'll say no, and then you'll say, okay, I remember this pencil and paper, and you'll be able to work this out. So you'll do something like this, and you'll just eventually come up with the correct result, okay? Now, Reflect on this for a minute. If I ask you to divide, let's say, 10 divided by 2, I think everyone here can do this in their head, right? Now imagine I keep making bigger and bigger numbers. There comes a point at which the numbers start to bounce around in your head, and you can't keep them straight, and you eventually say, I, I'm not going to be able to successfully solve that problem. Now, this particular problem is sufficiently big that I think I would have trouble doing it in my head, but it's maybe at the boundary of what I could, what I could get done. But I could add enough numbers there that I couldn't get it done in my head. But if you give me a piece of paper and a pencil, I can get that done. I know I'm belaboring this, but this is a really unusual situation, isn't it? OK, that we're, we're, we have a cognitive ability. It has a limit. By making some scribbles on a piece of paper, my abilities have expanded. That's really unusual. That's very interesting. OK, think about a computer program. How many of you could write a 10-line computer program accurately in your head? How about a 100-line program? I, I think at that point, the answer is none of us, I, I would hope, OK? <laughs> and like 1,000, 10,000, 1 million lines, forget about it. There's absolutely no way that you could keep that straight in your head, OK? So we are really doing that in computer programming. We're leveraging the outside world uh, plus our own cognitive abilities to get something done. OK, 
And the reason that that happens is that because what we're thinking about going on inside our head and the scribbles we make on the piece of paper, for example, in long division, are lined up with each other. They're aligned. And you can see that because if I change the representation of that problem, I don't think this is going to help anybody get that problem done, right? Roman numerals. And you're like, okay, okay, fine. Roman numerals, nobody even knows the Roman numerals. But if I do something like this, and I just put the numbers in strange places on a piece of paper, I haven't really made that problem easier to solve, okay? And it's something about the way I think about the problem and the representation on the paper need to be aligned, just like in the Stroop effect, in order for me to have high performance. So I don't have data uh, for the long division example, but I bet it looks something like this. If you change the representations, you get worse behavior. So in psychology, this is called distributed computation, or distri uh, sorry, distributed cognition. And it's been studied for quite a while. Uh, and what they find is that when the idea in your head and the idea on the piece of paper externally are mismatched, the performance drops a whole lot. Okay, and that if you want to have high performance, obviously, you need to align what's in your head with what's outside your head. So one thing that was studied extensively is navigation on the bridge of a large ship. Okay, now take a look at this picture. How many people are there? There's a lot of people there. Do you think they, you know, like five o'clock, toot toot, they all go home? No, I mean, this is a 24 hour a day. There's people rotating in and out of that bridge and they're collectively making scribbles on pieces of paper so that you know, as I come into the bridge and someone else leaves the bridge, that we are seamlessly still steering the ship, even though it's multiple people and there's a very complicated way of making scribbles uh, on the pieces of paper of the ship. So I wanna draw your attention to two different parts of this. First is that there's a team of people, each one of which does, has only a limited understanding of overall what's going on. The second is that all of those people have to have an internal idea about what navigating the ship means that must be aligned with what's going on externally. Sometimes those things are really obvious. You can see the radar screen there, and I think there's a natural analog, but you can imagine there's many other kinds of uh, information that uh, is being tracked uh, that we have to keep uh, straight between all those people. So in order to have success, and I'm belaboring this point because we're gonna come back to it, is that we need to have compatible theories, not just between uh, an individual and the piece of paper, but compatible theories amongst everyone who's on the team, okay? Because if we don't all have compatible theories, we're not really gonna effectively be driving the ship in the same direction. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm gonna stop. There, here's, I, I thought of another example for this, which seems completely ridiculous, and I haven't built a slide for it, but just imagine uh, that two of us uh, come up with a book company, okay? And uh, I'm gonna work in the daytime and my partner is gonna work in the nighttime. And on the first day, I record on the piece of paper, uh, book in $10, book out $12. And then my partner comes in overnight and he says, book in $10, book out $3. And I come in the morning and I'm like, what's going on here? This doesn't make any sense. It turns out I think I'm selling books he thinks he's renting books. Okay, I know that seems very silly, but the point is that with just a small change in the language, because I use these vague terms like book in and book out that didn't activate the theory, it allowed that misunderstanding to happen and allowed two different people to have two different theories of what's going on. And we can see that same sort of thing happening in programs. If I'd said book purchase $10, book rental $3, it would have been immediately obvious what was going on. Okay, now, when we do long division, we never do it as a team. It's only an individual effort. Just imagine if each person, <laughs> that the long division was so big that we had to divide it up across different people. Oh, just imagine how hard that problem would be. Uh, and you think about like us building software, and, and just like if you think about it as an abstract activity, we're gonna get a couple hundred people together to build a really big piece of software, and you think about it this way, you're like, it's never gonna work. It can't happen, but it does. So in order for this to work, again, the programmers need to have an internal understanding that's consistent between them and the other programmers, and they need, need to be making scribbles on a piece of paper, that is the source code repository, uh, that is revealing the model inside the program, the theory inside the program, and we do it uh, dropping clues to other programmers. So for example, uh, we call it customers and not X, we have named design patterns that we drop as, as hints inside the code because that activates the theory when the person reads it. 
Uh, note that uh, I'm using really trivial examples like variable naming, but really, if you think about the theories that are inside programs, they are very deep. They're just harder for me to express. So just as a thought experiment, if you wanted to make your coworkers really angry, you could drop false clues into the code. And that, again, it shows uh, how they are really using those clues. Um, you could use uh, comments like, this is unused, when in fact it's not unused, or uh, switching the words client and server, or my favorite, uh, something that's a remote procedure call, you call a cache. And how long is it going to take them for them to figure that out when they're trying to do stuff? I, I don't recommend any of these things. Okay. Um, now, these are the external representations. These are like the scribbles on the piece of paper. And it's much harder to see what that theory is inside someone's head. Uh, and that's what I'd like to talk about next. And I'm going to pause and ask you guys what you think the theories are inside your head. Just, I don't need you to say anything. Just think about it for a minute and actually try to come up with an answer. And the reason I'm going to pause is because I don't want you to be completely angry with the answers that I come up with, because it's really hard to do this. And I don't want you to be thinking, like, what I've come up with is trivial, because I think it's really hard. So we need to chip away at this one. Um, so let's try to sneak up on what a theory is. Let me compare how someone who was trying to build a theory would behave compared to someone who was not trying to build a theory would behave. So on the left, you might say, I've got a new requirement for my program. OK, does it challenge our current theories? I think, I think about the architecture. I think about the domain model. And I say, do all these things still work with the new requirement? If the answer is yes, you keep going. Otherwise, you need to revise your theory first. Then, perhaps if you're doing test-driven development, you write the test case to make sure it works. Uh, you write the code. And then, boom, your tests are passing. Okay. Now, compare that on the right-hand side with, and this is very similar to what you actually see articulated in some books, get a new requirement, write the test case, edit the code as necessary, refactor to remove redundancy. Okay? And I want to point that out, that uh, oftentimes people talking about refactoring are shooting for an elegant theory that explains things, but oftentimes they're, oh, they're not. Uh, they're, in fact, just saying remove the redundancy from the code, which is not quite the same thing. So let me talk to you about the so-called von Neumann architecture. Um, I should also point out that people tell me that my talks are just nonstop examples. So there's lots more examples coming. It's just a nonstop avalanche of examples. OK. So uh, you guys are probably familiar with this, the so-called von Neumann architecture, where he sat in on some uh, design meetings for early computer design. And he wrote them up while he was on a train ride. And people are upset because they said, look, these are the notes from a combined team. Unfortunately, it's got your name on it. And all you did was add some logical notation to it so that it was more palatable for other people. OK? This is the argument. I'm not going to dive into the argument. But what I am going to talk about is, wait, they're saying that all you did was connect it to a domain that we already understand quite well, this logical notation. OK? Now, Maybe that is exactly the thing that he did that was valuable, right? He took something that we did understand, and people have been studying for hundreds of years, and he connected it with something that was brand new, and he showed how you could understand the thing that was brand new in terms of the thing that was uh, already there. That represents a new kind of understanding that perhaps was not present in the design group that had invented all those machines, okay? You guys may have had that same example, uh, or that same feeling, if you've ever done any architecture recovery work. So, this is the only time I'm going to compare myself, or that I will ever be compared with von Neumann. Um, but if you walk into a client and you talk to them about their architecture, you may be saying probing things because you're starting to see some patterns that you already recognize, but that they don't recognize yet. And that, in fact, that recovery and that connection of the specific to the general is, in fact, the building of a theory that helps them understand better and helps you understand better. So here's the big idea, is that developers weave many different theories into a program. Okay, maybe the best way to think about this is if you think about a novelist. A novelist, if they're going to write a book, has probably some idea of the hero's journey. It, he starts out at humble origins. He goes on a quest. He returns home uh, via some glory. Or character development. Sometimes you don't care about the characters because the author hasn't done a good job of connecting you with them. Uh, foreshadowing, dramatic irony, tension and humor, release. All these kinds of things need to be woven together. You can understand them individually, but a novel is interesting when you put them all together plus some differences, right? Because otherwise, there'd only be one novel in the world. Okay. 
So think about a programmer weaving a program. An idealized version of programmer as we would see them based upon our uh, prejudices here from this conference, okay, is that there are some you know, things that they invent right now, uh, some domain models that are specific to their program, there's things like mathematical logic, patterns and styles, and various different development processes that they bring in and then they build a program using all these things. So I've identified, I know this is profound, uh, that oftentimes developers build models of the domain and represent those in the code. Okay, this is an old idea, certainly going back to Simula in the late 60s. Okay? There's also a whole bunch of things that we consider domain neutral. Uh, I'm gonna call those solution patterns. So you think about uh, idioms, uh, design patterns, architecture patterns. Uh, there's a, uh, a new book out in the last couple years on programming styles that I think is also another catalog of these theories. Uh, and there's also things like responsibility allocation, encapsulation, parsing, all those kinds of theories are domain neutral theories that programmers build in. And one that uh, I'm increasingly becoming aware of uh, is mathematical logic and other formalisms that we also weave into our programs. Uh, we can do that in some trivial way, like you have a method that returns a Boolean value. Okay, well that's sort of like a predicate, uh, but you can actually build it in much more deeply like people do in functional programming. And interestingly, this thing is not only domain neutral, it's actually solution neutral. The, the mathematics of it is solution neutral. Each one of these things has two different dimensions in itself. Uh, so for example, you may have uh, domain models that are general. For example, if you go uh, to a working group that has built an ontology, uh, and you can adopt that ontology. Uh, but you also have uh, domain modeling that is specific for your particular company or your application. The same thing is true with solutions and is even occasionally true with the mathematical formalisms. So at some point here, you're gonna have this perception that says, wait, George is using some funny words. He's called it uh, theory building instead of model building. And he's basically appropriated all the different things that we figured out in software engineering and we try to teach to people and he's gonna put it under the category of theory building and then say that's what we're doing and there's really nothing here, okay. So I would say to some extent, yes. For the part that we consider common models, I'm trying to recast the things that we understand as common models. And that only makes sense. If we thought it was important enough to teach to other people to write up in a book, uh, that probably ends up with a durable, reusable, valuable theory. But there's the other part when it comes from the ad hoc dimension that a lot of developers are just not paying attention to. That is, they're not focusing on that aspect, okay? Uh, they don't get any academic credit. They don't get a paper published if they come up with a domain-specific model for uh, their particular application. So that's the thing we should be focusing on. And I'd just like to point out that every time I uh, see someone try to make a grand unified theory of software architecture, uh, that it ends up being unsatisfactory. It's more like that geocentric model that's unbelievably complicated. And it's certainly something that we should strive for. All right. So at this point, all the theory is on the table. <laughs> um, all the examples are on the table, perhaps. Uh, and it's time for me, I don't know if this, uh, this metaphor translates, but in the United States, we have this idea of there's an old guy sitting on his front porch or in his yard saying, ah, kids, get out of my yard. He's like the old cranky man uh, who's not happy with anything. So this is the part of the talk where I get to be the old guy on the porch saying, ah, software development. Okay. So. And this is totally based on my own uh, career arc and the limited number of companies that I've seen the insides of, et cetera, et cetera, many caveats here, okay? So let me suggest that over the course of software development as I've seen it, uh, we did allocate time during our processes to actually doing modeling. Uh, that theories were first-class citizens. Maybe we didn't call them theories, but we certainly in our documents had a section where we would build, say, a domain model and describe how these things worked. Uh, if you didn't do that section, as often you didn't, you held some kind of guilt inside of you because you knew you probably should be doing a domain model. Um, there was a separation between the way that things uh, work outside your program and the explicit representation, say a, a database model uh, of the data structures. There in universities was uh, a movement towards teaching specific uh, development practices like object-oriented analysis and design. 
uh, there was a specification and the implementation being taught and design patterns uh, as a specific thing were being taught. Uh, we had, or at least we were moving towards a common notation for doing this stuff. Uh, and the feedback loops, I will call them as, they were medium fast, okay, on the order of months. So let me compare that with, again, my biased version of today, which is that processes seem to rarely allocate specific time for modeling. Uh, theories are not first class citizens anymore. They, they do sometimes come up when it comes to like domain driven design. Uh, developers seem to feel no guilt anymore. Like the guilt has been removed when they don't try to follow a process or don't try to build models. Uh, oftentimes the separation between the domain and the implementation uh, doesn't really happen. People treat them as synonymous things because they're always working every single step inside the code. And here is where you guys are in a much better position to talk about this, but uh, the developers that I come in contact with who t seem to come from pretty good universities, uh, they rarely are able to tell me about Booch and Rumbaugh and Jakobsen or any other sort of like, here's how you build software. I mean, Jackson Structured Design, you name it from any point in history, they just have never heard of these things. Um, the, uh, the idea of design patterns, they maybe know two or three of them, okay? So if this stuff is being taught, it's not successfully making it into the brains of the developers that, that I see who are in their early 20s. Uh, basically, UML in industry is treated as a, a, a bad word uh, and you don't do it. Um, and the good news here, because there has to be some good news on this slide, is that one thing that compensates for all those other things is we have very fast feedback loops. I mean, like, uh, uh, test-driven development is everywhere, okay? And when you have that, you have uh, very quick feedback loops that you're doing the right thing. Software development, uh, sorry, software delivery may actually happen on the order of uh, every day as fast as that. And certainly, I think few people are developing software on the once a quarter, twice a year kind of development cycles that we had uh, early on in my career. So, more good news. Developers build theories anyway. <laughs> so, like I said before, they have a lot of intellectual curiosity. They don't like to repeat themselves, and theories allow them to write terse or code. And realistically speaking, management tolerates a whole lot of slack. Like, if I want to go off in the corner and build a model and try to figure stuff out, they're going to tolerate that. But they, the processes that are chosen do not encourage the theory building. We're not teaching it directly in universities. And I've actually had developers tell me that they find modeling valuable, so they close the door, assuming they have one, and they build models on the side so they don't get stigmatized as the guy who builds models. And we're all like, ha, 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 not funny. So here's what I would suggest that we should be shooting for. The first thing is that we want balanced systems and theories. That is, that we're evolving the theory and evolving the software so that at any given point in time, we're ready for the next requirement. Now, in this esteemed audience, I know you guys recognize this, technically speaking, as a quality attribute scenario and saying this is a specific one. But let me just say we should probably be promoting this for almost every system that this is a kind of thing that we're looking for. The second is that we want to be specifically trying to develop chalk talk ready developers, okay? They're, they're ready to do that zooming in and out and cross-cutting uh, kind of discussion at the whiteboard. And I'm not satisfied to say that people have to be 35, 45 before they're ready to do this. What I've noticed is that once a developer can do this for one system, if you put them on another system, they get up to speed on it pretty fast, okay? Uh, and if that's the case, that means that there really has been some change inside them that makes them ready to do that on another system. Uh, so I really think that uh, we should be able to do this, uh, say, in the mid-20s. That's what we should be shooting for. Our processes should be focusing on theory building as a first-class artifact. Now, I know this perhaps may be the most difficult thing to actually do because uh, there's been a very strong wave of uh, hard-nosed, practical, uh, very quick iteration software development focusing on the deliverables. But I would like to see theories in the code, theories on the whiteboards, in the documents, and in conversations. We should treat brute force solutions as a code smell. And what, by this, I may, may mean something slightly differently than what you're thinking. That if you have a requirement, say like, on Wednesdays, the customer should get a discount, right? And if you, if you solve that with an if statement, that's like, I know that, but I don't know how. Okay, like I don't have a theory that underlies why that output should be that way. I can just write the if statement and boom, the program is working again, okay? So I think if we treat that as a code smell and that were, we all agree that's a code smell, we would, uh, we would start to build the theories under the cover. 
And I think it, a result of this stuff is you end up with so-called senior engineers much faster. The next thing, and this is where I'd love to have help from you guys to understand exactly the nature of this, is that universities should teach modeling specifically as a first class thing. So what I see is I see software developers who started programming at a very early age, say sometime in their teens, and so when they get to me, they've got maybe eight years of, of programming experience. They may be actually far more fluent in uh, quirky languages than, than I am. Say they've done some Erlang programming or some Haskell programming, uh, but they have zero years of modeling experience. And so what happens is when you're already good at something and you're in an environment that uh, reinforces working on those same things, what do you do? You do more of the same thing, the programming, not the modeling. And I would say then what we try to do is we try to activate those techniques in context. If you know how to build models generally, you can build operating systems, database, et cetera, models. And that uh, we could refactor some of the books that already exist. So for example, there are two books that I know about, uh, Documenting Software Architectures and Requirements Engineering, that we could just refactor those and say there's a lot of techniques that are being taught there that are really teaching modeling uh, and uh, the models that we use. So in conclusion, uh, building theories, like models, is building value for the engineers and for the companies because programming should properly be thought of as theory building. The second is that programming is really distributed cognition. It's not just you as an idealized thinking machine typing a perfect program that you know, meets its output. Instead, it's you and a bunch of other people doing some cognitively demanding task that's almost impossibly hard when you break it down into its steps. We need to be thinking about how we can do that more effective, effectively by spreading that theory throughout the team and making sure that that theory is recoverable from the code. So programming is really about building theories. These theories are critical for us to understand programs, and I think there's really good opportunities for our current practice to change for the better. Okay, thank you guys very much. Appreciate it.